Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to the video, The Mirror of Passover, The Chiasm of the Lambs. I'm introducing this video in a special way only for the simple reason that we actually did this video live at a church in the Apple Valley area, and we had issues with our camera at about 25 minutes. So at the end of 25 minutes in the video that we recorded there at the church, you're going to see me back again here in this Zoom video, and I will finish the lesson that way only for the simple reason that we had issues with our camera. So let's begin. Let's begin the video of the Mirror of Passover. And what I want to do, just like in Jesus' day, I want to do a blessing. Because when Jesus was visiting the synagogue during the week and they were into Bible study, and some of you that were taking my class either in the Beit Zephyr or the Beit Midrash, okay, the schools that they had in the synagogue, they always did a blessing to God, basically blessing God for His Word. So I will do the Hebrew, and you'll repeat after me slowly, and then together as one, as one body of believers in Yeshua, we will read it together in English. So please repeat after me. Baruch Hata Adonai. Eloheinu Melech HaCholam. Ashir Bachar Banu. Mikol Ha Amim. Veinatan Lanu. Et Torato. Veinevoim Hatovim. Veinatan Lanu. Et Abesora. Mashiach. Yeshua. Veinatan Lanu. Et Abrit. Chadasha. Barukata Aronai. Noten Hadevere Emet. So in English, let's say this together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all people and given us his Torah and the good prophets and given us the good news of Messiah Jesus and given us the new covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the words of truth. You're looking at the March calendar and with looking at the March calendar, you'll see right down there in the lower left-hand corner, there's March 28th. So here we are, and you'll see a little picture that I have associated with March 28th, and it's Jesus riding on the foal of a colt uh, into Jerusalem and because of Palm Sunday. However, what I've done also, if I superimposed the biblical lunar calendar on this solar calendar, we have the solar calendar in March, but you'll notice that today, okay, even though it's March 28th, on the biblical calendar is Nisan 15. Nisan 15, because it's the 15th day of the month, means there's a full moon tonight. <coughs> this is a lunar calendar. So, two weeks previous to the Nisan 1 was the new moon. So you can see Nisan 1 there started on March the 14th, two weeks prior to this. Now, uh, one thing I just want to mention very quickly. In Jesus' day, the day always started at sundown. It did not start at midnight. So technically speaking, Nisan 1 that you see there on March, March 14th actually began at sundown on March 13th. So the sun went down, March thir uh, then it was Nissan 1, you got to midnight, it's still Nissan 1, nothing changes. Then the morning, and then all the way through sundown the next day, then Nissan 2 starts. So everything in Jesus' day, day begins and ends at sundown, all right, not midnight. So for instance, take a look at Nissan 14, there on the right side, Nissan 14, and I have a picture there of the a plate from the Passover Jewish Seder. And if you ever did a Seder meal, you'll probably recognize some of the things like matzah and there's an egg there and some other stuff. However, what happens is that they had their Passover meal last night all over the world on the same night, basically, at the, well, not necessarily at the same time, on Nisan 15. Nisan 14 is the Passover. So at sundown, 
Saturday, yesterday, sometime after sundown, every Jew on the face of the earth, depending on when sundown is and where they're located, they had their Passover meal last night. So that was Nisan 15. It continues today, Nisan 15. And through Nisan 15, it ends at sundown today. So just to give you an idea of the biblical calendar, Jews go by the biblical calendar, especially with regards to the feasts of God. Okay, they do not go by the solar calendar. They do go by the solar calendar with regards to business. Now, one another thing is the Jewish people today call the day when they have their unleavened or, or when they have their Jewish Seder, they call that Passover day one. Passover day two will start tonight after sundown and so on. However, that's not biblical. They change it. I won't go... <laughs> Email me, okay, uh, call me or whatever, and I'll glad to help you why they changed it. In Jesus' day, the day when they had their Passover meal was called the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, not Passover. Passover is always the day before. And that's biblical. Leviticus 23, you can go in there, and the 14th day of the month, okay, is Passover. The day that they have their Passover meal, okay, is going to be the 15th of the month on the lunar calendar. So today, the first day of unleavened bread is called Passover 1, and it really mixes Christians up, especially when they're trying to study this stuff. I remember when I first got involved in this, how confusing it could be. We're going to focus in on Jesus' day, all right? So today, even though it's Nisan 15, even though the Jewish people say it's Passover 1, sorry, they're wrong, okay? Passover 1, there is no Passover 1. There's the first day of unleavened bread 1, okay? That's biblical. So just to give, but there's a reason for it. It makes sense. I don't want to go into it right now. So with all of this in mind, I have a bunch of questions. And we're going to take a look at some of those questions, and we want to see if there's a way of answering some of these questions. Now, you are looking at six days. Here are six typical days. The black line that goes up and down, the vertical black lines, are midnights. So for us, the day would start at midnight. The day ends at midnight, right? But not in Jesus' day. So we're looking at six days in the times of Jesus, and these orange lines are times of sunset. So now we know that for Jesus, the day ends at sunset and begins at sunset. So we're going to put down some lunar dates in here, according to the lunar calendar. And starting on the left, we see Nisan 13. Nissan 13 ends at sundown. Nissan 14 begins. And Nissan 14, from a biblical point of view, it's right in the Bible, is Passover. Nissan 14 starts at sundown, midnight goes through, the sun comes up, Nissan 14 continues. Uh, we get to the ninth hour, and we know what the ninth hour is. Jesus died at the ninth hour. We get to sundown on Nissan 14, and Nissan 15 begins. The first day of unleavened bread. And then so on. First day of unleavened bread ends at sundown. Okay, not at midnight. And then the second day of unleavened bread. And there's seven days of unleavened bread. Now Jesus had his last supper on Passover. Unequivocally, that is, that is absolutely true. The reason being is why we know it is the next day, as you just follow the events, we know that Jesus was crucified and the lambs were slaughtered for the Passover meal at the same time, okay? So Jesus had his meal the, for us the evening before. But from the Jewish calendar, no, it's on the same day. He had his last supper on Passover, yes, the evening before. So the lambs were slain, and he is crucified and died and was buried before sundown. Sundown happens, and that's when the Jewish people would have had their Jewish Passover meal. It's called a Seder today. In Jesus' day, it was probably not called a Seder. Like I said, that's one of those questions you'd say, what does Seder mean? Uh, email me. Okay, there's just too much here. Now, Jesus makes a fascinating statement. 
No, but the thing is, is that Jesus is God, and he says something very fascinating. And he said, I will be in the ground for three days and three nights. Yes? So, here's the three nights. We know that, therefore, on Nisan 14 in the afternoon... He was crucified, he was put in the ground, so therefore three nights pass, and all of a sudden we come to Resurrection Sunday, right? Now isn't that interesting? Because if this is true, and Jesus meant what he said, he never died on Friday. Now that's tradition, are you with me? So when you have your Good Friday service, what you probably need to understand is, he probably did not die on Friday. There's a lot of evidence to suggest he died on a Thursday in 30 AD. If he dies on a Thursday, this works. Perfect. Matter of fact, if he dies on a Friday, he never came in on Sunday that you call Palm Sunday. It's impossible because of the Jewish culture. Take a look at my podcast, listen to them, and I'll give you all the details and all the references and so on. So that's fascinating. It's a very interesting question. But what I'm after is this. The Last Supper and the Jewish Passover meal. Do you notice that they're on two different days? Right? One is on the evening of Passover, Nisan 14, and the Jewish Passover meal is on the next day. God commanded that the bat, that Jewish Passover meal must and only can happen on Nisan 15. Period. That's in the Bible. He never said you can change it from one day to the next. So did Jesus have a Passover meal? According to the Bible? Absolutely not. Okay, now could his meal have been like a Passover meal? Yes. Okay, but one thing for sure, he could not eat the Passover lamb because the Passover lamb can only be sacrificed when he died and he was already in the grave when they're going to have the Passover lamb. Okay, so that's a very interesting question. So that's one. So therefore, Jesus' uh, Jesus' Last Supper that I call the Passover meal of the Messiah cannot be the Jewish Passover meal. They could be related, but how? That's a question I have. Another question that I have is the following. It's fascinating that when you actually use scholarly Jewish literature, and the church does not, it's amazing what you learn. This book by Raphael Pate is called The Messiah Texts. I am just amazed that religious Jewish scholars in the past 2,000 years wrote this stuff. This is from their own writings. It's from the Bible. It's from the Talmud. This is Jewish writing. And what's fascinating is this. Raphael Pate says, It is remarkable. Listen to this. This is a Jew telling you about Jewish literature and about what Jews believe. Listen. For it is a remarkable fact that the major features comprised about the Messiah, which developed fully between the 2nd and 12th centuries A.D., are outlined in the biblical story of Moses. When the Jewish rabbis see Moses, they see Messiah. When they see the Messiah, they see Moses. This is interesting. For instance, the Messiah is of the most noble royal blood known in Israel. He's of the house of David. They know that. That's biblical. That's a biblical prediction. Yes? Okay? I mean, they believe that. He's from the house of David. So do we. Moses is of the noblest line that existed in those early days among the children of Israel in Egypt from the priestly family, family of Levi, or as we pronounce it, Levi. Interesting. They're both part of a royal family. The great task of both Messiah and Moses, the great task, are destined to fulfill is the redemption of their people from bondage. Amazing. And it goes on. I, I mean, I could go on page after page. After, listen to this one. This is amazing. There's a rabbi. I'm trying to find the date when he lived. 
but Rabbi um, Berechia, Berechia, and I know it was someplace between 200 to 300, uh, 500 AD, but I don't have the date when he actually lived, but he stated this, as the first redeemer, Moses, so the last redeemer, Messiah. Moses is the first redeemer, Messiah, and we know that's Jesus, is the last redeemer, the ultimate redeemer. Just as the first redeemer was received by the children of Israel and hidden from them for three months, so the last redeemer will be revealed to Israel and then hidden from them. And nobody knows when he will be seen again. That's Jewish writing. This is amazing to me. Now, where do they get it from? Well, if you take a look at Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. Now, I only have partial of the verses up there. It says this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Later on in the verses, the Lord said to me, uh, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them. It shall come about that whoever she will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Now let me just stop here. The word prophet, do you notice that is used here? That's the English word that translates the Hebrew word Navi. Say Navi. Navi, Navi does not not mean somebody who predicts the future. That has been such a complete mistranslation by the church. Whenever they say prophecy, prophet, they always talk about prediction of the future. A prophet does two things. A prophet proclaims God's word and may occasionally predict the future. Did you hear what I say occasionally? If you study the Bible, Moses is a prophet. He is given God's word, not only given God's word to say to Pharaoh, but also to his people. Does he predict the future all the time? No. Does he, does he predict the future? Yes, a few times. Does Jesus proclaim God's word? You better say yes. Okay. Second of all, does he predict the future? All the time? No. So you need to understand what's going on here from a Hebrew perspective, okay? Somebody is coming that is going to be proclaiming God's word and may occasionally predict the future. Look what Jesus says about himself. This is in John 17, 7 through 8. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. He's speaking to his father. This is a prayer at the Last Supper in John 17. For the words you just gave me... Stop. What's the prophecy prediction in Deuteronomy 18? Somebody is coming. He's going to be one who proclaims my word and even predicts the future. He's going to be like you, Moses. What is Jesus saying? I've been given God's word. I gave it to my disciples. Okay. And I speak my father's words. It's amazing. This is probably where they got it. And so when we read the words of Jesus, we need to understand Deuteronomy 18. If you don't understand Deuteronomy 18, and you're not Jewish, and you don't live 2,000 years ago, you don't get it. This is what a Bible historian does. I really want to get into that stuff. So, it's fascinating. Take a look at this picture. I found this on the internet. I do have the credits here. This is not my picture. However, we see Moses on the left side and Jesus on the right side, yes? This comes from this idea. I mean, Jewish literature for 2,000 years and longer? Okay, talking about the connection between Moses and Messiah. So with regards to Moses and Messiah, we see on the left side in the top, it, uh, Moses is sent by the Lord given and given what to say. Jesus is sent by the Lord given what to say. I'm not giving you the Bible verses. You want the Bible verses? I challenge you to two things. One, find them yourself because everything I'm doing is quoting the Bible. Number two, if you don't want to do that, email me and I'll give you the Bible verses. Like I say, we'd be here all afternoon if I was doing all of that. And we notice that with Moses, there's blood on wood. Yes? And with Jesus, there's blood on wood. One happens to be doorposts, one happens to be a cross. Interesting, they're both connected somehow. Okay, God says to Moses, you're going to be like God to Pharaoh. Jesus is God to the nations. 
Another interesting connection. Another connection is the fact that with regards to Moses, he brings to the people to the mountain of God, Sinai. Yes? However, Jerusalem becomes the mountain of God in Isaiah. You have to read the verses in Isaiah. The mountain of God changes position. It now becomes Jerusalem. And we know that at the mountain of God, we see God's glory. At the mountain of God in Jerusalem, we see God's glory. Who's God's glory? Jesus. We saw him at Jerusalem. On top of that, there's a new covenant given at Sinai, and there's a new covenant given at the mountain of God in Jerusalem. Interesting comparisons and questions. Why? Why? Okay. Here's a third question that I have that comes out of all of this. What's fascinating to me is when we go into the Bible, Many people like to say that Jesus is the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb and Jesus are one and the same. Where do they get it from? Well, in the Amplified Bible, I'm giving you the quotation from 1 Corinthians 5, 7. That's the only place in the Bible, the only place where your Bible might say that Jesus is the Passover lamb. In the Amplified Bible, it says, Purge, clean out the old leaven that you may be fresh, new dough, still uncontaminated as you are. For Christ, our Passover, now notice the word lamb, it's in square brackets. Now, if you know anything about the scholarly work called the Amplified Bible, if a word is in square brackets, it's not in the original Greek. It's not there. People assumed that because Jesus is the Passover, he's got to be the Passover lamb. No, the Bible doesn't say that. However, there is the complete Jewish Bible. Get rid of the old chametz, which is the leaven, so that you can uh, be a new batch of dough, because in reality you are unleavened. For our pa Pesach lamb, Pesach is Passover in Hebrew, Pesach lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. The uh, complete Jewish Bible is wrong because it put the word lamb in there and it is not in the original Greek. Sorry, he's wrong. The ESV study Bible or the ESV Bible. I have three copies of the ESV Bible. Do I use it? Yes. What is my main Bible that I use? The NASB. I'll show you why in a second. The ESV says cleanse out the old leaven, etc., etc., because Christ is our Passover lamb. Wrong. It's not in the original Greek. When you get to the King James and the New American Standard, the last two, I want you to notice what it says. It's highlighted there in the gold. Christ our Passover. That's all it says. Now, to prove it, and I want to show you the proof, just not my opinion, I'm going to take you to Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Sinaiticus is the Greek one of the ancient Greek translations of the New Testament that we know was written between 330 and 360 A.D. So this is like the original Greek. This is where we get it from. You'll notice that the blue words are English next to the Greek words that are in Codex Sinaiticus. Okay? I just want you to notice as you read through this, as we get to the last three lines, unleavened also for the Passover of us was sacrificed to Christ. That's how it reads in Greek. But I want you to notice something. In Codex Sinaiticus, dated to 330 to 360 AD, the word amnos, which is lamb, right there at the bottom, is not there. Jesus is the Passover not the Passover lamb. This is fascinating. If you study the Bible and you go into the Old Testament and you say, what is the Passover? God says it exactly. The Passover is a day. He tells you exactly. This is my day. It's my Passover. On top of that, in the New Testament, it's a person. Jesus is the Passover. What? Whoa, what's going on here? He's not the Passover lamb. He can't be. Let's take a look. So when we actually go into the Greek and we actually pay attention to the two main Bibles, the only two versions, 
from a scholarly point of view, the New American Standard and the King James are closest to the original Greek and the original Hebrew. Everything else, no. That's why I use the New American Standard or the King James. Modern King James is a good version as well. So, Jesus is not the Passover lamb. This is the very words of God. It's not my opinion. Nowhere in the Bible that you'll see that Jesus is the Passover lamb in the Greek. Our translators did something to it. And I'm telling you, as a Bible historian, I really have a lot of problems many times with the translators because they bring their own prejudice and their own traditions to translating the Bible. And that's why I'm really getting into the Greek, into the Hebrew. So it's clear, it's clear why many of us think this. I did for a long time, okay? Especially with that verse, if, especially if you have an NIV Bible, okay? But Jesus is like the Passover lamb, but he is not. That's clear. That's God's word. Now, so far, look at this. We have blood on two pieces of wood. One happens to be the doorpost. The other one happens to be a cross. So far, we have two Passover meals, one on the 15th of Nisan, one on the 14th of Nisan. So Jesus could not have the Passover. He didn't have a Seder. He couldn't have. It was impossible. He's God. God declared in his word the Passover meal will be on the night, the sundown after the Passover lamb is slain. That's the 15th of Nisan. So he couldn't have had a Seder. Was it Seder-like? Probably. Very much so, probably. So God seems to be making a clear distinction. God is. Not people you hear on the internet. It's almost like they're mirror images. And we have a deep chasm in between. And you can see that chasm in between the Lord's Supper, which I like to call the Passover meal of the Messiah. It is Passover. He had his meal on Passover. Remember, it started after sundown on Nisan 14. He had his Passover meal on Passover. Okay, but the Jewish people have it the next night on the first day of unleavened bread. Is there an answer? I want to show you something that few people even know about. Bible historians do. Those who understand the Greek and the Hebrew, we know. Those of us that might say are scholars with regards to the Bible, we know it. And let me introduce you to the following. Chiastic biblical structures. You say, what? Even though you are not in a PhD program in some biblical studies program at a university, I'm going to bring you the truth. I respect your intelligence. I respect your desire to know the truth. Are you with me? So I'm going to give you complex topics. You need to see this. This is God's word. Wait, you, they're all over the Bible. And nobody teaches this. Again, there's the website. Email me, I'll get you the website. There's just We just have to go on. I want to explain this so we can get into it. What is a chiasm? It sounds like something you have after a bad dinner. Okay, yeah, I went to this Chinese restaurant and I'm, oh man, I ate them. Oh, I had a chiasm that you wouldn't believe, okay? <laughs> Here's a chiasm. You're reading the Bible and you're reading one verse after another and you come to verse A, okay? Verse A. And you keep on reading. So the next verse is verse B. And the next verse is verse C. And then the next verse is, yeah, that's how you're reading, yes? However, a chiasm says, look at the verses that come before. So, if we go backwards and we take a look at the verse just before verse A, we're going to call it B underlined. And in other words, it's related to the verse that comes after A. The verse before A is related to the verse that comes after A. They're like an image, a mirror image. With me? The second verse after A, which is C, okay, is a mirror image of the second verse before A, and so on. This can extend for many, 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 many verses. So, for instance, here's a chiasm. You read verse D, 
Then you read ver uh, D underlined, then C underlined, then B underlined. Then you come to verse A. You keep on reading. Then you come to verse B and say, wow, verse B, the verse that I just read after A, is very similar to the verse before A. Verse C, the second one after A, is like the second one before A. Now, to give you an example, okay, and there are many, they're all over the Psalms. It is unbelievable. Somebody said that Psalm 23 is a chiasm in itself. The book of Revelation is a chiasm. The first three, ch it's, it, it's crazy. They're all over the place. Here's Matthew 6.24. Let's read it. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You've heard that time and time again. That's a chiasm. Look at this. The center verse is the key. Notice what the two A, the A and the underline, love and devotion. Those are connected, right? The verse after A is despise. The verse before A underline is hate. You see how they're related? They're a mirror image. The second verse after A is you cannot serve both God and money. C, underline, is you can't serve two masters. That's the mirror image. That's a simple one. Okay? Here's one that's going to be more complex. Oh, and what's important? Okay, in a chiastic structure, this is a literary structure. It's not only in the Bible. This is a literary structure. You can find this in other great works of literature. The writer will use a chiastic structure to make a point. What's the point here? The point is love. Devotion to one. What interferes with it? Money. And the love of money. Do you see what's going on? Okay. So this is the point where we had uh, some problems with our video camera. They're all fixed now. But we lost the last few minutes of the video that we were doing there at the church. So we will begin here. And we'll be taking a look at the next chiasm, the next spectacular chiasm, which is the chiasm about the flood narrative. So what you're looking at is starting in the top left-hand corner and working your way down on an angle there. We start at Genesis 6.10 where it says Noah and his sons. B is all life on earth, Genesis 6.13. Uh, the first part of verse 13, that's why it says 13a, and then curse on the earth, which is the second part of Genesis 6, 6, 13, all the way down, as you can see, the waters increase in Genesis 7, 17 through 20. Then we jump to the top right, where it says water decrease, we're continuing, Genesis 8, 13 through 14, and then exiting the ark, Genesis 8, 15 through 19, and so on, until we finally get down to Noah and his sons, where it says Genesis 9, 18 through 19. This is an amazing chiasm. Again, associating the last verse or the first verse that we're reading. There is a middle verse. And we've got to take a look for that one. It's someplace in between water's increase and water's decrease. And so we're taking a look at verse A. And that verse A is related to Noah and his sons in Genesis 19, 18. So Genesis 6, 10 related to Genesis 9, 18, where it's talking about Noah and his sons. So these verses are a mirror of each other in the chiasm. Then the next one, all life on earth, Genesis 6, 13, the first part A, and we get down to all life on earth, Genesis 9, 16. And again, we have this mirror image as we're getting closer and closer to the middle of the chiasm. We've got the curse on earth there in Genesis 6, 13b, which is the second half of verse 13. And then we have the blessing on earth. So we have a curse and we have a blessing. Those are related. A curse and a blessing are not equal to each other, but we have to realize that these verses are related. Something is happening to the earth. The next one is the flood is announced in Genesis 6-7. However, in Genesis 9-11, no flood for the future. 
So a flood is announced for the present, but there will be no flood for the future. And we keep on going. And indeed, we find that we indeed have a chiasm. And the question would be, once we take a look at the chiasm, what is the verse in the middle? That's the important piece. And when we take a look at the verse in the middle and the Genesis flood narrative, it's Genesis 8.1, and God remembered Noah. What I find fascinating about that, it is a statement of God's love, of God's grace, of God's compassion in the midst of the terrible flood that he brought upon the earth. Amazing. So we take a look at the mirror reflection of the lambs. And what's interesting is there seems to be a chiasm of the lambs. We already have talked about the fact that Jesus cannot be biblically the Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God. Quite definitely, the Bible declares that Jesus is the lamb of God, and there is the Passover lamb. Now, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the two lambs. And let's take a look at a fascinating, fascinating chiasm. So when we take a look at the Passover lamb, we're talking about a political deliverance a social deliverance in the sense that Israel is delivered out of bondage of Egypt. They enter a new covenant with God at Sinai, and they become the nation of Israel, where we would say through the Lamb of God, we are delivered from the bondage of sin. And our, you might say, freedom is to be established as God's people free from sin. Now, we're going to return to Passover. And if you notice there on the left side, it says the Passover lamb is slain and the lamb of God dies. Jesus died roughly about the same time when the Passover lambs would have been slain in the temple in preparation for the Jewish Passover meal that would happen after sundown. Now, what I want to do is this. When we take a look at the Passover lamb slain, we're going to take a look now at a series of events that goes into the future. So what's the next thing that happens after the Passover lamb is slain when we think about the book of Exodus? When we think about those days 3,400 years ago, well, we would say they put the blood, up, blood on the doorposts. But now let's take a look with the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God dies. However, in order for Jesus' blood to be on the wood of the cross, he was bleeding prior to his death. This is amazing. In order to get blood on the doorpost, the Passover lamb needs to be dead. In order to get Jesus' blood on the cross, he needs to be alive on the cross. So, in the upper part, the Passover lamb is slain. The next event that happens is blood is put on the doorpost. But when we take a look at the Lamb of God and his death, what happened just before that is his blood was on the cross. So the Passover lamb is slain. Blood is put on the doorpost. And the next thing that happens is God talks about a night of watching. Now, this is relatively either before or after the Passover meal, but indeed, it's one of the events that would almost happen simultaneously. God was declaring that this is a night of watching. For Jesus, it was a night of watching. We remember this in Matthew 26, 38. He's at the Gat Shemanim. He is at the Olive Press. We call it Gethsemane, Got Shemini, the olive press. And he tells the apostles, why can't you, or his disciples, why can't you watch with me? It was a night of watching. Going back to the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb is slain. The, the, door, the blood is put on the doorpost. It's a night of watching. And the next thing that happens is they have their Passover meal. For Jesus, the lamb of God dies. 
Prior to that, his blood is on the cross. Prior to that, it's the night of watching. And prior to that was his Passover meal of the Messiah, which happened on Passover. These are mirror images of each other. One is going forward in time. The other one is going back in time. And we're meeting at the death of the Lamb of God. So what's the next event for Israel? The bread. The unleavened bread. God said to Moses in Exodus 13, Moses, this unleavened bread, this is going to be a sign for you on your hand or as a frontal on your forehead that the word of God is in your mouth. Jesus takes the bread at his Passover meal. I wouldn't be surprised if it was unleavened. He takes that bread. He says the blessing. And he says, this bread has been broken for you and it's my body. It's me. His 11 disciples, Judas is already gone. They would have known the connection of what Jesus is doing with the Passover meal that would have happened or would have happened for them and probably did happen the next night. Jesus is saying he is the living word and the Torah is the written word. Amazing, amazing mirror images. So for the Jewish people, the Passover lamb is slain. Blood is put on the doorpost. It's the night of watching. They have their Passover meal, which is now called a Seder. During that, they have their unleavened bread, which is the word of God in their mouth. The next thing that happens is that they are delivered out of bondage from their enemies. But for Jesus, prior to that, earlier in the week, he's delivered to his enemies as he enters Jerusalem. And again, mirror images of each other. A chiasm of events for the Jewish people. What happens to them after they go through the Red Sea and they come to the mountain of God and see God's glory? Jewish people say that indeed we were baptized in Moses as we went through the Red Sea. And as far as Jesus is concerned, he is baptized. And also, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration where we see his glory. Events in Jesus' life as a mirror image of what was happening at the first Passover. And then we come to an amazing event where God's Shekinah glory, actually Shekinah is the proper pronunciation, blazing fire, the light of God's glory comes down so God will dwell with his people and the light of the world, Jesus. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. An amazing, amazing chiasm of events. And in both cases, it's Emmanuel. But I don't think it's over. Because when we take a look at the book of Genesis, and we take, at the book, take a look at the book of Revelation, it's as if we're taking a look at a mirror. With regards to the book of Genesis, we know that light was created, there was no sun or moon. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a little bit later in those verses, it says, let there be light, and there was light. As you continue on, God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning one day. But a little bit further on, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. That's the sun and the moon. And God thought it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. So for the creation account, light is created and there was no sun or moon. With regards to John's gospel, he said, in the beginning. <laughs> so any Jew reading John's gospel thousands of years ago, when he says, in the beginning, they're going to be reminded of the creation. And he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Then he talks about associating the Word, which is Jesus, to the light, the light in the beginning. John is associating the light in Genesis the light that was created on day one with the Messiah. But when we get to Revelation 21, 22 through 24, we read 
that I saw no temple in it, which means the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb, the light. The light is Jesus. And all of a sudden we have the mirror image of the book of Genesis with the mirror image of Revelation. John saying that that light in, in Genesis chapter 1, the light created on day 1 is like the light of Messiah. And in Revelation 22, he's inspired to say that indeed the new Jerusalem, where we're all going to be with Yeshua, with Jesus, that it's going to be lit with no need of the sun or the moon, with the light of Messiah. An amazing, amazing connection. And an amazing, amazing chiasm. So two lambs, the Lamb of God and the Passover Lamb, two structures of wood, the doorposts and the cross. The amazing thing that we see is that it's as if the chiasm of the lambs takes us all the way to Genesis and all the way to the book of Revelation. It's as if that day when Jesus died, it was a chiasm from Genesis to his death and from his death all the way to Revelation. So I wish you Hag Pesach Semech Ve'et Heyom Shalom Lekum. Happy Passover and the day of his rising.